Look at the adjective. Play. Aretha Franklin. And I have half the brain that you do. It, now is the franchise gonna take the Viagra? Oh, gonna put the butts in the seat. Hello there, wrestling fans, and welcome to Yes Indeed. It is episode 100 of Because WCW, the podcast where the big boys play. My name is the Twisted Genius, Dean Ayers, and I am accompanied as ever by my broadcast colleague, the DAZN journalist, and what, what are we going to call you this week, Liam? We're, Liam, we're... it's Liam Hat, by the way, everyone. Yeah, hi, by the way. Um, yeah, so I, uh, this is a big day. It's a big episode, Dean. Yeah, Please I, make I don't feel... Nice. You see, on the one hand, I feel that I, I should be particularly abusive, and on the other hand, what? I feel that I shouldn't be particularly abusive, and I should respect the occasion. I'm torn. Really, I am. This is how Stockholm Syndrome starts, isn't it? Yep, definitely. I think more the St- Stockholm Syndrome would have been when we were uh, in lockdown and we couldn't leave the house, and all we could do is record because WCW podcasts whilst yeah. watching night shows. Yeah. No, that's that's not a uh, that's not Stockholm Syndrome. Do you know what that is? That is a golden age of podcasting. Golden age of podcasting. Now, tragically behind us, but we have uh, we've done something very special for our episode, our hundredth episode. Um, this this kind of came about a bit a bit sort of organically on on Twitter, didn't it? Yeah, I mean we're we're always looking for for you know we we bring on repeat yeah we love having some of our good friends on again if they're available but we are looking to expand those horizons get new guests get new insight especially when it comes to those rare opportunities we get to have on a a, a genuine WCW alumnus uh we've we've had a pretty good record you know we've had Sonny Ono Jeff Jarrett Dave Benzer Lady Blossom we've not done too bad we had uh legit first air audio from a spoken word tour with Bret Hart where you were yep. the one hosting it and funnily enough I was the one asking the questions or the question that lasted like longer than every other question in the history of the world but three um, minutes yeah yeah what an answer oh my days um so we've done quite well for that but obviously we're, we're not we're not like the the most connected wrestling media people in the world. We're just a couple of guys who love to do this podcast, and we'll reach out. We'll we'll try and contact some people, and we also sometimes pull out these little tweets like, "Who do you guys think we should contact? Who do you think would be amenable to to the possibility of chatting all things WCW with us one evening?" Uh, and yeah, with a little bit of help from uh, previous guest, the Brooker man, Chris Brooker. We reached out to someone who was there in the final year of the company or less of the company's existence. Someone who hails from Calgary, Alberta, Alberta. Canada. <laughs> and uh, as it turns out, is someone who really loves to just sit back and talk wrestling. And it was a pleasure to have Lance Storm do an interview with us that we'll get to very shortly. Yeah, um, we wanted someone special to mark our hundredth episode, and and we got him second time of asking because uh, yeah, Chris Chris tweeted that and, and tagged Lance Storm, and I think I think you very politely said we'd already tried reaching out to him and and uh, and he hadn't responded, and, and you, you were very polite, and he just said reach out again or try again because uh, clearly the message hadn't got across to him. And, uh, and within a few hours, we had uh, we had a recording date organised. So um, so I suppose we uh, we should get to the interview. Um, so uh, uh, in, as they would have said in the olden days, Liam, roll VT. Let's um let's have a listen to our exclusive because WW100 interview with Lance Storm. And I'm very pleased to say that we are now joined by our special guest for this 100th episode, a man who spent 
nine months in world championship wrestling, but made quite the impression and collected quite a lot of silverware in that time. To be precise, he was the hardcore champion, the cruiserweight champion, and three times he was the United States heavyweight champion, as well as the first WCW wrestler to appear on WWE television. Hello and welcome to Lance Storm. Hello, Lance. No, although I do feel like I need to correct you. I was a three-time Canadian heavyweight champion. We, we renamed that sucker. Yes, we will come to that. We will come to that. Although shortly. it's funny that, again, with if you count the three U.S. title runs, five singles title runs, and I only ever actually lost two of them clean. I gave two away, and yep. one I lost when uh, Bill DeMott pinned... I think it was Jim Duggan he pinned for some reason. Yep. It was Jim Duggan in a uh, handicap match at Halloween Havoc 2000. Yes. Yeah. So other than I did, in fact, get p- uh, pinned clean by Terry Funk and Amarillo. And then finally, in the very end, to Bill, uh, he would have been General Rection probably still. That's right. Yep. Yeah. But uh, only had to get pinned twice to lose five championships. <laughs> It's quite the record, and and then you won that U.S. title back at um, at Nitro in in Liam's home uh, home city of London. Which I was, was there, well, yeah. So was I. Yes, great night. Oh, that. when I won it back from from Rection yeah. after the Jim Duggan loss. Yeah, yeah, that was the, the uh, Major Guns heel turn. I think it was that one, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, okay. So that actually would have been before the Terry Funk one, because. I have a, a handheld version of the Terry Funk, uh, both t- Terry Funk title changes. And it was it was live events. And, yeah. and ter- Terry, quite obviously, wasn't watching the product. Oh, actually, no, Terry's would have been first because uh, Major Guns was with me, but against her will at that point. Because she was still a baby face, but Terry obviously wasn't watching the product and just assumed that since she's managing me, she's a heel. So throughout the match, he was reacting to her like she was a heel, when in fact she was a baby face on my side against her will. Right. Poor old Terry. I've, well, should, should we should we mention it now, Liam? Should yeah, we get out, out of the way, way Dean. Yeah, yeah, out the way. yeah there, there, there is a running joke on our podcast, because back in the, uh, the days of the FWA in Britain, there was one show, our big show of the year, and I managed Terry Funk once, and I haven't stopped banging on about it in 20 years, Lance. So, so any mention of the great man brings a smile to my face. And anytime you can tie yourself to Terry Funk, that is a tremendous claim to fame. So the, the fact that I, again, I, I consider it my favorite match probably of my career, because wrestling Terry Funk in his hometown of Amarillo, Texas, was a real treat. Because, as everyone sh- should, I love and respect Terry Funk so much. Absolutely. A, a, a unique man in and what a legend in the, in the world of wrestling. So um, let's, um, let's, well, we'll start, we'll start at the beginning of your uh, WCW journey. Um, you signed for the company um, in the middle of 2000. You'd come from ECW. That company obviously was in a, a, a bad way. It was struggling um, when you left the ECW. You then went to WCW, and and in the benefit with the benefit of hindsight, of course, WCW wasn't doing too well at the time. I mean, when you, how did you feel when you arrived at WCW? Well, I, I was quite happy, and and it's it's so weird because obviously I went to WCW for the security. You know, because I think everyone up until probably a day or two before it died thought WCW would be here forever. So, you know, getting under the Turner umbrella where you you know your paychecks are secure and you think the future of the company is secure. It was a real comforting time to know that I'm in, you know, the big leagues for lack of a different term. But, you know, under the umbrella of a, a major company that, you know, is going to be there for a while. And the feeling of job security was really comforting. Little did I know that it would be less than a year and it would be gone, but it was, it was pretty cool. And, you know, I didn't know a ton of people there at the time, but I, you know, made friends very quickly and it it was a lot of fun. And um, we've, we've covered uh, the, 
the great um, Nitro book by Guy Evans. We've we've spoken with him before, and one thing that comes out of that book and other things that you just just hear on the on the grapevine are various stories of uh, should we should we say the left hand not knowing what the right hand's doing in 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 WCW sometimes, and ha- having worked for both ECW and WCW. Who, who would you say were the more uh, organized uh, company? Uh, that's, that's, that's so strange in that, like, there was just so many, so fewer parts in ECW because you basically just had Paul. Yeah. So it didn't feel in disarray because you always knew who to talk to. And if and when you got an answer, you know, it was you know, where we were going or what was going on because he was really the only hand steering the ship, where in WCW, there was always a constant change. Like, even in my, you know, 10-month run there, you know, there was several different people in charge. So it was just sort of the constant flux of not even knowing who was in charge. But with that, it was very organized in that you know, your travel and your schedule and everything was was done like clockwork. Like, this is back in the days of the fax machine. You know, yeah. you had to have a fax machine. It was actually in your contract. You had to have one. And it was like every Thursday, I got the fax that had my hotel, rental car, airfare. Like, everything was just faxed to me like clockwork. So it was like it was super organized in that regard that everything was taken care for you. And I was one of the fortunate ones that managed to get hotel and rental car covered. So it was like everything was booked, everything was done. So in that regard, it was super organized. But on the creative end, you could tell that, you know, one day that the next, the wind could change. Yeah. Because um, they they had, I mean, in that last year, there were so many resets and relaunches and redirects, as you say, so many different people in charge. Yeah, because I was hired by Russo and Bischoff. It was the the R and B uh, connection, if you will. That you know, I met with both of them, and you know, yeah. negotiated the contract with Eric, and then discussed creative with with Vince. But I'm pretty sure Russo left and came back, left and came back at least twice during my ten months. And wow. there was definitely a period where Eric was persona non grata and out of the picture. And then there was even the time, which still amazes me where we had Turner executives come in and hold a talent meeting and tell us all that Eric Bischoff and Fusion is buying WCW and they've agreed to let him run everything while they finish the paperwork up and said, here's Eric Bischoff. He is now in charge and once all the ink dries, he will be the owner of WCW. Thank you very much. And then, like, two or three weeks later, WWE's in the locker room going, we own you. And it's yeah. like, what the heck just happened? So it was a very tumultuous time. But, again, to go back to how I felt, I grew up a WCW fan. And when I broke into the business, my goal was always more WCW than WWE. Okay. So so getting there, like I fully in my heart figured this is my last stop. I'm going to stay here till I'm done. I always liked the more sports presentation of WCW and the NWA. And I figured there was job security, I had a very good contract and was getting on with everyone really well. It's like deep down I suspected I was going to be here until I retired. And then ten months later, I was somewhere else. Yeah, things. So, so it sound, from what you're you're saying there, those. Uh, I mean, we we've, we've we've gone right to the end of the WCW era, but it, it, it's appropriate to carry on talking about this. I guess that it, it sounds very much like it was almost an overnight change in that you ex, you expected Bischoff and Fusion to take over, and the next thing you knew, WWE or well, Shane Shane McMahon's at Nitro. Yeah, there was, you know, probably a couple or three weeks in between where you hear rumors and I'm talking to everybody I can, you know, that gets tidbits and news to try to figure out what was going on. And that's where, you know, there's people who who do the, oh, well, you had to know WWE was buying it because, you know, there was rumors all over the Internet. And it's like, but we'd had the meeting where executives from Turner said, it's a done deal. Eric's your boss now. 
and Eric's not our boss now. So it's like at that point, a rumor on the internet that Vince has bought it doesn't carry any weight with me. Yeah, sure. Well, so until I pulled into the parking lot at Nitro and saw a WWF transport truck parked in the, you know, in, in the parking lot, and then, again, it was Shane McMahon, I think Bruce Pritchard, and either Gerald Briscoe or Pat Patterson, I don't remember, but there was three executives, if you will, from WWE that came in and said, you know, we're in charge now. And it was just like, wow, I guess this is true. So that's the, so you're basically, you're turning up for a live television broadcast and, and this is the first that you know that it, it's confirmed that WWF are taking over world championship wrestling. Yes. That was the first proof. Yeah. There proof, was a yeah. lot of speculation. There was, um, Jeff Merrick who used to work for the law. He was sort of my go-to source for wrestling information. We were friends and he had, he hooked me up with my website and was running my website. So he was my go-to and he was, it's looking like WWF is buying it. And this is probably what's going to happen. But until they walked in the door, I, I didn't 100% believe it. And what, what was the atmosphere like backstage? Because, and, and, and also how yeah, you're, you've got a, you're a professional wrestler. You've got a job to do. You've got to wrestle a match on a, on a live broadcast with all of this stuff happening in the background. What was the atmosphere like? And how did you do your job that night? Well, doing my job was the easy part. It's like, I'm good at that. So it's like, <laughs> I, I never, you know, never thought twice about, you know, extra pressure or stress. Yeah. I suppose, and again, thinking back, it's like I was probably a little more, it's like, okay, you really want this to be good. But it's like, I was like that every night. So I, I didn't feel any different pressure. It was just, wow, this is strange. Wonder where it's going to go and what's going to happen. And it was very... After the event was when the emotion and the mood really set in of, you know, what truly is ahead. But once the show's going on, it's like, get with your guys, do your match and do your thing. And it's like, that's the easy part because, you know, that's what I'm best at. So yeah. that part was easy. It was just sort of the, there was still a degree of unknown. Like I had known that, <clears throat> known again, I was told that there was a WWF short list of, you know, a dozen or 10 guys that WWE definitely wanted. And I was told I was on that list. Okay. And I believed again, when, when we had the big meeting and everybody came in, you know, they said everyone would have an opportunity, but Shane did speak to me. And I, I remember this. I, I wish I remembered the exact wording, but he came over and said, you know, look forward to working with you. And he tried to use my, if I can be serious for a minute, catchphrase to sort of be funny and with the, hey, hey, I know, but he got it wrong. And it was sort of that right. funny of, well, it's nice to know you know who I am, but aren't as familiar as you should be because you got it wrong. And half of me wonders if that was half done on purpose to uh, put me in my place or whether he just made an honest mistake of, yeah, I know who you are, but you're not important enough for me to actually get this right. Or I guess that we, we can change anything we want about you if you come over here. Well, they certainly did that too. Yeah, I mean, there's. Uh, I mean, well, let, let's let's just go. go we, on to we've something. gone through like four years in ten minutes. <laughs> uh, let, let's just talk, talk about while we're on the the subject of the WWF about the the fact that you you were the first WCW wrestler to to invade the promotion. How how did it come about that you were that person? I think it was more just the circumstances as why it was me, but, but I had, you know, almost no notice. We had after the last night, and just a, a tidbit of, of uh, trivia. I was the last wrestler to leave the locker room. I had, after my match, I just sat there in my gear contemplating. And I realized that everyone else had left because they wanted to go to the bars because it was spring break. So I was the last person to leave the WCW locker room and then ended up being the first to enter the WWE locker room. But they had been flying all of the WCW talent to Stanford to meet with Jim Ross to sort of have a, you know, a introduction initiation. Hey, this is what we're going to be looking at forward and discussing, I think, changing contracts over and stuff. So they were doing that with all of the people. 
And I got a call from Johnny Ace, who was the, the intermediary between WCW talent and the office. And he said, we're doing this. We're flying everybody to Connecticut, but Raw's in Calgary next week. It seems dumb to fly you all the way to Connecticut when we're just going to be in your backyard anyway. <laughs> Come down to the Saddle Dome, and you'll have a meeting with JR and just discuss everything then. Okay. And this is where I think it was a situational thing. Is I, I think they wanted to keep it as secretive as possible. So the fact that I wouldn't have to go to an airport, wouldn't have to fly anywhere to do the invasion, sneaking me in, so to speak, is really easy. And since they didn't even tell me that I was doing it, I had my gear in my car because you just always do. Always bring your gear. Absolutely. Yes. Now, granted, I, you know, I lived you know, 15 minutes away. So if I didn't have my gear, I could get my gear, but I get there and it's like, Hey, I'm just hanging out. And Jim Ross was really busy. And it's like, I hadn't had a chance to meet with him yet. And then it was either Johnny Ace or Dean Malenko or someone, you know, just goes like, Oh, Hey kid, you're on tonight. And I'm, I sort of like, yeah, right. You know, you know, you know, figuring they're ribbing me and I've just ignored them. Yeah. And then Johnny came up to me later. He's like, you know, you got your gear right because you're working tonight. And I'm like, you know, F you, Johnny. I'm not working. I don't rib me. And then he's like, no, I'm serious. And finally, I realized he was serious. And he says, yeah, you're doing a run in. I'm like, oh, crap. OK. And this was probably only, you know, at most two hours before I was going to do it. So I had to run out to my car and grab my, my suitcase and bring it in and found out what I was doing. And it was like, oh, okay. And, th you know, I had to put my gear on and then I had to put like the janitor's coveralls on while they snuck me up to, you know, the upper deck by the concessions. Yeah. And then as the segment for what I was going to do was getting ready, then I've got like two or three security people with me where they make sort of the human wall so I can get my coveralls off and hide behind a pillar until it's time to run in through the crowd. So it's like I had no warning. And I think it was probably so it didn't leak where if they were going to, you know, fly Booker to Calgary, they'd be like, why are they flying Booker to Calgary? There must be a, an angle tonight. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, absolutely. And also what, what you mentioned there is, is, is quite interesting because you, you just lifted the veil a little bit there on the, on the how a, a run in through the crowd works, because I've always wondered that bit in, in a, a huge arena, like the, like the, the WWE go to. So you, you basically get taken, you got taken up to the the top of the arena with some security guys, and then then you're 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 left to make your way down at the appropriate moment. Is that how it works? Yeah, pretty much. And my again, my WCW debut was the same. Just I didn't have gear. I did street clothes, so it was easier for the two security guys to sneak me because I could just you know, I don't know whether I put a hat on or not, but it's like you know. I just in regular clothes, I can sort of walk through the crowd, get where I yeah. need to be and then come out. But when they wanted me in my gear and they wanted it to be a surprise, uh, that's when I had to wear the coveralls. And then they just sort of tried to hide me against a wall where they couldn't see me until I could run in through the crowd. And I, I remember, too, that I was really nervous, not about the angle, but they wanted this big, huge reaction, you know, for this WCW invasion. Yeah. but. Like, I hadn't wrestled in Calgary in, you know, over a decade. Oh, and I'm wow. like, you know, because since in the Indies, like, probably like yeah. 94, 95. Well, okay, it would have been, I guess, six years. But still a long, a long time. But it's like, I'm not getting the Titantron. I'm not getting the music. I'm not getting the introduction of, you know, from Calgary, Alberta, cool. Canada. So it's like are they going to recognize me in time to pop? Because I'm only going to be in the ring for about 25 seconds. So I was concerned that if they don't realize who I am, yeah. make the connection that I'm the hometown guy, if I don't get a big reaction in my hometown, I'm done. It's like, <laughs> they're going to go, this guy isn't even over in his hometown. <laughs> so I was concerned. And, and the funny story is, as far as how quick it was, I had a buddy, my gym partner from that. He owned the gym, but I was my training partner. I had got him tickets for him and his wife and his two, maybe three kids at the time. So he's sitting in the crowd and his youngest kid dropped, you know, their toy or their soother or whatever. 
and he bent down to pick it up off the floor, he heard this loud pop, found it, sat up and looked around and there was nothing going on. And he looked at his wife and said, what did I miss? <laughs> and she's like, you missed Lance. And he's like, what? It's like, yeah, he ran in and ran out. And he, he didn't see me. So it was that fast. That's brilliant. <laughs> That's but I'm, I'm guessing there is there is a, a a definite sense of relief when you got that pop. Yes, it's like they know who I am. Thank God. Brilliant. Okay, let, let's go. Let's go back to the the beginning of your time in in WCW. You you were first of all you you came in as a babyface. You paired up with uh, in a team with with Billy Kidman. Were you or were you aware that you were going to be turned heel very quickly, or was that just a case of of changing creative? There was no advance notice of anything, because at that period of time in WCW, I don't think anything was planned more than a week in advance. Like they had their booking meetings on Wednesdays, I'm told, and that's when they decided what they were going to do on the Monday. Right. Because, the, you know, we did Nitro on Monday, taped Thunder on Tuesday, and Wednesday was the, all right, what's next? Mm -hmm. And they were making it up as they went along. Because, again, and this is a funny story, that first meeting with Eric and, and Russo, once I had negotiated the contract deal with, with Eric, you know, I'm sitting there and R Russo sits down across the table from him and he's looking at me and he's like, you know, just the first idea off the top of my head, just spitballing. I see you as being Eric Bischoff's illegitimate son. He says, because you have that same arrogant look on your face that he always has. And I sort of looked over at Eric and Eric looked back at me and I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, was that a compliment or is he like, I, I, I don't know if this is good or bad. Although you don't I think want to it, say the wrong thing, I guess, to you. No, but do you you also agree the, or not? And the first thing that's running through my head, I'm like, what is Eric like 10 years older than me? It's like, and I, I he, I, th I think he's, you know, 16 years older than me. He was older than I thought because he lo he looks was if his hair's black he looks really young. Yeah. So I'm like, it, technically he could, uh, you know, he's maybe 15 years older. So it's it's possible genetically that he could be my dad, but I just thought this is an absurd idea. And he's like, yeah, because Eric was involved in a lot of angles at the time. So. Russo was thinking that whenever he was getting outnumbered in trouble, I would run in and be like, why is this guy saving Eric? Why is this guy saving Eric until the eventual payoff that I'm his illegitimate son? But again, it was just a spitball in that first meeting. Yeah. And then the first Nitro that I got to was actually, I did photos for promotion. I didn't work the first Nitro. It was Salt Lake City. They brought me in. And Eric found me in the hallway. And he's like, just so you know, he says, I killed that whole illegitimate son thing he says i'm involved in enough angles i'm like <laughs> fine by me eric i'm good yeah so when i started the run-ins it's like i don't even think at that point they knew where it was going and i just think they got after that first couple of run-ins it's like okay we need to pay it off somehow and they tied me into kidman and then again i think it was only the week before probably on the thursday um after their 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 creative meeting that I got the call from Johnny Ace that we're going to turn you heel and you're winning the U.S. title in the tournament. So like maybe two weeks in advance at most. So it was like, you know, we have to wrap up this thing with Kidman, which is why I turned on him and we did the blow off match on the same show. Yeah. You know, we, we did the tag match where he's making fun of me behind my back on my national anthem thing. I leave him in the match and he gets beat. And then we do the blow off like three segments later because the tournament was the next week and we needed to be done with this stuff. So that's how far they were planning in advance. But I did. And it was, I think the only time I ever got advance notice on anything that Johnny did call me and say, you're winning the tournament. We need to come up with what your finisher is going to be for sure. I had been using the half crab just because uh, my first match with disco they're like yeah you're beating disco beat him with your finish and it's like i hadn't had a finish really so homeless like um and it was glenn that was like well what's your finish and i'm like um 
you know, Justin and I had been doing the stuff pile drivers. I did the regular one. He did the tombstone whenever we did a double. Yeah. So I'm like, and I've been doing the cradle, you know, gotch pile driver just because it was Jerry's finish. And in Jerry, my feud with Jerry, I would use his finish against him. So I'm like, I can do the cradle pile driver or I've been doing, you know, I've got this rolling half crab that's pretty cool. And I think Disco, just from a safety standpoint, went, I'll take the crab. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, do you want to have a Boston crab or, or be dumped on your head? I'll go for the crab, definitely. Because he probably didn't know my work, and he's just, oh, there's this guy from ECW. It's like, he's probably dangerous. So he said the crab. So I won with the crab my first couple of matches. But Johnny Ace called and said, you know, I don't know if we can make all the baby faces submit. That might be a hard sell. Let's come up with an impact finish so you can do a one, two, three. And we spent, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes on the phone and never really come up with anything we liked. And Johnny just said, ah, screw it. I'll make them all tap. He said, I'm the agent anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go with that then, John. So then we had the tournament and I won three matches in a row by submission because Johnny was, because that's the thing a lot of people don't realize that my initial run in the one I did on three count, the very first time I appeared, that was Johnny's first nitro too. Oh, okay. I had met him at the airport in Denver when we were connecting to whatever, you know, Butte, Montana, wherever the hell that show was. And I had talked to Johnny back in 94 about going to all Japan. So I had had phone conversations and it's like, I go to my gate and there's Johnny Ace. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing here? And he's like, oh, hey, I'm just, you know, flying in just to see what, you know, what the landscape's like in, 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 in the U.S. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And then I get to Nitro and he comes up. He's like, all right, you're going to be doing a run in. Let's see, we need to find out, you know, what area of the arena is the best. And I'm like, I thought you were just checking out the scene. <laughs> He's like, well, I'm just ag agenting this one segment just sort of as a tryout to see, you know, what's what. I'm like, okay. And then he was my agent on every segment for like the next, you know, several months. <laughs> I love it when things like that happen. Where, yeah, you just, you, you and someone that you've, you've met ages ago somewhere else and you just, your paths collide again. It's, yeah, one of the, well, it's one of the the great things about about wrestling, but um, and it was it was a really good pairing too, in that Johnny was coming in as an agent, pitching himself as a great finish man that can really you know up the quality of matches, the complexity of the finishes, because all Japan was such a strong, complex finish territory. Cool. So Johnny needed to prove his worth, but he would need to have someone that could have more complicated, harder working, good matches. And since I'm coming in, I want to prove my value. And obviously my strength is good wrestling. So it's like I needed an agent that could get me more minutes in my matches, allow me to have harder working matches. So it was a great pairing because if I didn't have Johnny, I wouldn't have got as many minutes. And if I didn't have Johnny, he wouldn't have forced some of the guys that I would have been working with to do as complex and, and intricate finishes and so forth. So we really helped each other out early on because I could do the more detailed match work that Johnny wanted. And by Johnny having a bit of political power as the agent, he could allow me to highlight my strengths as well. So we really helped each other out. So yeah, win-win situation. Absolutely. Um, so as as you mentioned earlier on, you very quickly um, you won three uh, singles belts: the United States title, the Cruiserweight title, the Hardcore title, and you changed. And, and this was one of my favorite angles of the, this era in WCW. Um, you you changed the names of the titles. Uh, the United States Championship became the Canadian Heavyweight Championship. The uh, Cruiserweight belt was the uh, 100 kilos and under championship, um, and and these had you know big maple leaf uh, stickers over the over the normal um, front of the belt, and then the hardcore title became uh, the Saskatchewan Hardcore International title SHIT, which my my gut feeling is that 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 name was a Vince Russo idea. It's got his fingerprints all over it. Would that be true? Yes, that would be very accurate. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's it's funny that, again, I, I've told this story uh, a few times, but not many people, not everybody knows it. 
the original plan, um, and again, it was, I'm pretty sure it was Russo I heard it from. It might have been Disco. They were both part of the creative team. But the original name they wanted was the Stu Hart International title. And the theory was that I was going to name it after the most hardcore man I've ever met. But throughout the day, they were trying to get a hold of the Hart family to get permission. And they never got permission in time. And I often wonder if they had gotten through to them, would they have told them we want to name a championship after you in honor? And, you know, a wrestler from Calgary is going to name it after you. Would they have told him <clears throat> what the acronym was going to be? Or would they have just said, we're naming the title after you? Because had they okayed and then found out that it was going to be the shit title, would they have been very happy? And, and a lot of people, too, don't... Again, I hated the name. I thought it was dumb. Yeah. But the idea was, and there was promos to the effect, that I hated hardcore wrestling because I thought it was garbage. So the whole point was I named it the shit title because I had no respect for hardcore wrestling. I liked traditional wrestling. Yeah. So that was where the name came from. And, and the the 100 kilos and under, again, we were all struggling because... Changing the U.S. to Canada made perfect sense, and there wasn't really yeah. rhyme or reason behind renaming the others. It just became a gimmick. But when they came to, when they told me I was winning the cruiserweight title, which again was the day of, I just looked at him. I'm like, but I'm not a cruiserweight. They're like, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm like, I'm billed at 230 pounds. I'm not in the weight class. Yeah. They're like, well, we don't care. We want to put another title on you. So I don't remember whether it was my idea or theirs, and then I expanded on it. I'm like, okay, well, at least when by naming it the 100 kilos and under, there can be a joke that we can get to at some point that I changed the weight limit to kil kilograms because the Americans are so dumb, they're not going to realize what a kilogram is, and they won't know I'm not in the weight class. Right, yeah. So sort right. of my way of cheating, it's like, because I think 100 kilos was the limit, which is 220 pounds. And I'm like, I'm 10 okay. pounds over this. Yeah. But they're not going to know what 100 kilos is. So it's like, I'll be good to go. So, so the idea of the, the, the you holding this this triple crown of singles titles, that just kind of, they thought it up one week from the sound of it. It wasn't a long, nothing like a long-term plan at all. No, it was one week at a time. They, yeah. they had decided to, Put me over, and again, I don't know this for a fact, but this is what I was told from Johnny, that my whole push was a bet. That in a creative meeting, Vince Russo was, ah, oh, this guy's wrestles doesn't have any personality. I don't know what to do with him. Probably because the the uh, illegitimate son angle fell through for him. <laughs> yeah. And Johnny Ace in the meeting said, "Are you kidding me? It's like give him to me for six weeks. He'll be the hottest heel we have." Oh. And they basically made a bet with Russo saying, yeah, good luck. You're never going to get this guy over. And again, I'm getting it secondhand, so Russo may not have said this. So Johnny made the call to go heavy pro Canada, put me in the U.S. title tournament. And I don't know whether it was his idea or whose, but I had thought of it years ago that, hey, you know, there's a U.S. title. It probably back when Brett was doing the Canada US thing, it's like, man, yeah. renaming it the Canadian thing would make sense. So when they said they were doing it, I was like, yes. So that was just as far as things were planned. And since it got over really strong and renaming it and putting the sticker on it on Thunder got such a good reaction in that Wednesday meeting, it's like, oh man, let's do this again. And I know it was last minute because... I beat uh, Big Vito for the hardcore title the following week. And Big Vito and Vince Russo were tight. Uh -huh. So at Monday, when I heard that I was wrestling Big Vito, I'm like, okay. Big Vito comes in and says, oh, hey, it's like we're wrestling tonight and tomorrow. And he, he said, again, I don't remember the order. But at that point, because he had talked to Russo and got Russo's plans, was I would defend the... U.S. title, Canadian title, and beat him on one show, and then he would defend the hardcore title on the other show, and he would win on the other one. That was the plan on the weekend when he had talked to Vince Russo. But 
five minutes after he said this to me, Johnny Ace comes up and goes, hey, tonight's title versus title, and you're winning. And Big Vito was not happy. He was off and running to complain and trying to get it switched. So the decision to have me win that second title was like at most the day before that they just thought, man, we've got momentum with this guy. Let's keep going. So we did the hardcore match and I won. And I think I defended it again on, on the thunder and beat him again. So I beat him twice instead of one each. And then that was as far as that went. And it was the following week that they're like, what can we do? And that's when someone says, Oh, let's throw the cruiserweight on him. And when I'm like, uh, I'm not a cruiserweight. They're like, I don't care. What's this? Just, just want to do it again. <laughs> just do it. Yeah. We've got buzz. Things are, you know, seem to be going well. And that's why, again, I mentioned when we first started, they ended up giving two of the titles away. It's because they never had a plan. Yeah. They just put the third title on me because, hey, this is good. And we had already booked the the title defense, the U.S. Canadian title defense with Mike Awesome at New Blood Rising, which was, you know, a week and a half away. And that's when someone realized it's like, well, we've got to at least have them do the try to get the fourth title and do the match with Booker because it just seems logical. I've won every other title one yeah. week in a row, you know, back to back to back each show. We have to do the the world title and we've only got one day to do it because the pay-per-view is on Sunday. So I did the the world title match with Booker the following week and it was all just jammed in because they were just making it up as they went along. And then again, it's funny because so many fans, you know, everyone remembers the triple title. Oh man, that was such a great run when you had all three belts. It's like, I had all three belts for two weeks. Yeah. I think it was like 13 days actually. No, it would have been two weeks. I gave them all away on the, the nitro after new blood rising. So I, I won the cruiserweight. The following week is when I failed to win the world. And then the very next nitro, I gave the other two belts away because they liked the story of me winning them, but they had no idea how to get rid of them. Mm. So I gave one to Carl Willett and I gave one to Elix Skipper as part of Team Canada so they could just move on. So yeah, it was at most a week in advance that, that whole run. So when when you're facing Booker for the world title, yeah, I mean, when I, I'll, I'll I'll tell you this that yeah, when when Liam and I were were kind of thinking of you know some of the things we wanted to ask you about. One one thing we've written here was, you know, how did it feel going for the the world title and being in that world title picture? But it it just you've just said to us that it, you were just kind of shoved in there at the week's notice because they didn't really know what they were what they were doing one week to the next. It's it's incredible. It it's really is, and that's the thing because everybody asks it's like, oh man, you know, what did you think? I'm like, I never had time to think. It's like I never knew one week to the next, and I was so busy. Like after I won the cruiserweight title that following day on thunder, I defended all three championships on the same show. So it's like, I show up and they're like, Oh yeah, you're defending all three championships. And at first I'm thinking, okay, it's one match where all three belts are on the line. And they're like, you're going to defend the cruiserweight title against Hoovy. You're going to defend the uh, hardcore title against Norman Smiley. And then you'll defend the Canadian heart, uh, the Canadian title with um, the cat. I'm just like, what? Like tonight. And I had like three promos, three matches in one show. And Hoovy, there's a language barrier and a more choreographed style, if you will. Yeah. And Norman, because he was screaming Norman and doing wacky things, it's like there was a lot of planning and getting things together there because I'd never worked with Norman ever. And then I've got the cat who's a little limited and you've got to really sort of. So I'm like, I was so busy doing it that I never had a chance to think about what they were doing the following week. Now, I remember being angry, maybe a stretch, but certainly disappointed that. Because it was such a rush to the pay-per-view, like, I thought the match with Booker T was really wasted. Like, you know, it should have been a very serious, very big angle in a match. Like, it's not only a world title match, but it's like this kid in the span of four weeks, I guess actually technically three weeks because it was Monday, 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 
could in fact win every singles championship, including the world title. Like this should have been gigantic. Mm. And half the match was Mike Awesome with a plate of ham sandwiches for Mighty Heidi. The I'm using the term because it was his gimmick. You know, the fat chick beside him because he was the fat chick thriller. Yeah. And it's like this. It wasn't even the main event of Nitro. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? It's like this world championship should have been at the least the main event of Nitro. And yeah. in hindsight, looking back and it it frustrates me looking back, but. Like Booker T, I think, defended the world title against Jeff Jarrett on the pay-per-view in, in Vancouver. And if they'd have just cut the angle on the Nitro that in Vancouver, in my home country of Canada, I'm going for the quadruple and I'm going to win the world title from Booker T, that would have been a way better main event than just another Booker T, Jeff Jarrett match with a guitar. And it's like in Vancouver, like this could have been just so gigantically monumental. And instead there's a, you know, it's a, I don't know how long the match was a, you know, a six minute match on television where three of those minutes they're shooting the woman eating cheeseburgers at ringside. And it's like, this is so not as big as it should be. And, and it's like, you, you think about some, some of the, the really memorable pay-per-views and, part and parcel of that is is the location and you know think for example the things that immediately pop to my mind are the main event of the canadian stampede pay-per-view with the the five half five man heart foundation against lod and shamrock and austin and all that and 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 there's um cm punk and, and john cena in chicago where the 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 location and the the partisan support is a massive part of that show and that match. And that's the thing too. It's like if you go back, I'm not just tooting my own horn here. There is video proof of it. If you go back and look at the reaction I got in Vancouver just to defend the US title against Mike Awesome, like it was crazy. There was just a sea of, you know, perfect storm, Lance Storm, Canadian flags in the crowd. Like I was ridiculously over. And I think, imagine if I was going for the world title. Yeah. And since he was there, they could have had Bret Hart in my corner. That would have been absolutely insane. Absolutely. The, that it would have just been this incredible moment and it would have cemented me as, and again, I'm not even saying winning. I, you know, I put over Booker cause I don't think I should have won the one world title then either, but having Bret Hart in my corner in a world championship match in Vancouver, it's like I would have been made in Canada to a level that was just ridiculous. And I think from a television standpoint, the reactions to that show and just the atmosphere would have been, you know, as good or better than anything they were getting in WCW at the time. That's yeah. for sure. D and did did you ever did you ever pitch that idea? Actually, let me expand that. How you know how how often were wrestlers given the freedom to to pitch ideas to to the the bookers in WCW? Well, I, I assumed the more higher ups had more opportunities, but it's like. Again, it was happening so fast. I never had a chance to talk to anybody about much. I think the only real creative stuff I had was, you know, in the naming of Team Canada. Because when, whenever it was, I don't remember the, I actually might have been at New Blood Rising, because I think that was where Elix debuted with me. And then we added uh, Carl Ouellette. But when they decided they were going to, give me more than just me the plan and it was vince russo that came to me it was like we we're going to be the canadian world organization and i just said what he's like yeah it'll be the cwo i'm like but it's order not organization he's like yeah i think it'd be funny if you got the name wrong oh, and i just looked at him i'm like since when am i a comedy troupe he's like oh but it'd be funny i'm like well how dumb would i have to be to not know the name of the biggest angle in wrestling at that point, it was like, it was the hottest, biggest angle in WCW history was the new world order. It's like, and I'm too dumb to know what it is. He's like, Oh, I just think it'd be good merchandising thing. It's like, you got a better idea. And I'm like, 
And I was, you know, I'm just like, well, hockey's associated with Canada, and it's like our hockey team's team, team Canada. It's like, how about we just wear hockey jerseys and call us Team Canada? It's like it's better than the Canadian World Organization. And we argued back and forth for a few minutes and finally just, fine, do what you want, and left. I'm like, okay, we're Team Canada. And that was it. And I was just, like, I was so annoyed at the, oh, it'll be funny. It's like, have you not watched everything? Like, my whole point is I'm not funny. It's like, that's the whole reason behind my personality is I'm not funny. Yeah, if I can be serious, as you as you often or as you mentioned, uh, Shane, Shane McMahon talking about that. It, it just sounds like Vince Russo had it in for you from, from the start, you know, not, or, or didn't want you to be taken seriously because you've, you've got the, the, the illegitimate son gimmick. You've got the Canadian world organ. Well, or, I can't say myself now, Canadian world organization gimmick. It, yeah. It, it, it's, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to say that. Cause I really think it's just, those are the kind of ideas that Vince Russo has. And I just think my skill set, my strengths are of a different approach to wrestling than his. So I, I don't think there was any ill will behind it. I think it's just a case of Vince Russo has certain ideas and they just don't fit with me. With you. Yeah. Okay. That make that makes sense. And I, I know um, Eric Bischoff has said, previously he uh the, the exact quote i've got here is that he thinks you uh lance storm never got to the seven and a half minute mark of his 15 minutes of fame opportunity um he he well this this didn't strike us as very fair given you know how how much you achieved in that in that short well, period of time and yeah you know, what are after after, after i buried eric's book he never had another nice nice thing to say about me so <laughs> right <laughs> That explains that, but I mean, the WCW was um was always they always talked about the the glass ceiling in WCW that yeah you had the the big main eventers on their big contracts with creative control and and it was really only until the the, the very end of of things when a lot of those guys disappeared that, that anyone else got a sniff at the main events. I mean, did when you went in into WCW did did you did you have a, a level you wanted to get to, or did you think that, you know, like in, in ECW, you could get to the, to the top of the card? Again, I, I went to WCW for the job security. I had a family. I had two kids. I was looking for a reliable company where I could work and make a good living. And I wouldn't have to worry about, you know, checks that wouldn't cash. So that was my primary goal. I knew there would be, a you know a a ceiling of you know the the Hogan's the Nashes the Goldbergs and stuff and that they, they were going to be at a higher price place in the card than me but it's like I figured I'd be able to have good matches a lot of people there it's like I, I went in with my eyes open and achieved more than I expected but again that <clears throat> banging your head on the glass ceiling if you remember the the night that I won my third championship for no reason whatsoever. And again, I don't know who booked it, but like Kevin Nash came out for a promo and got up in front of me to, I assume accent how short I am compared to him and gave me a big boot and sent me on my way and cut his promo. It's like, that was the, again, if you wanted to say that was my seven and a half minute mark where they decided that's all you're getting because there is, Nash didn't gain anything from it. I could have left the ring after winning my third championship. He could have came out and cut his promo because his promo had nothing to do with me and it wouldn't have hurt me at all. So there was no benefit to it other than, and I remember too, when they first came to and pitched it to me, it's like, Oh yeah, Kevin Nash come out and you get up in his face. And I'm like, well, I can get up in his sternum, but unless he's bringing a box <laughs> for me to stand on, it's like, I'm not getting up in this dude's face. It's like, I'm going to look small. And I think that was the intent yeah. to remind everybody that, yeah, he's, you know, he's getting over, but let's be serious now. He's, you know, a mid card guy and that's what it was. And I took the big boot and I left and it's like, if it wasn't for the fact that creatively they realized, well, we have to do the final one, which is why I got the, the shot with Booker. 
And then it was, okay, go do your stuff with the rest of the mid card. Thank you very much. And it's like, whatever, that's what I expected when I, you know, went there and I was working with good people. So I was, you know, I wasn't upset about it. I, I did think the Kevin Nash thing was just a complete waste in that it, it hurt me and didn't help him. And well, since there was, no, if we'd had done a match, then it's like, okay, they're cutting an angle. Right. But it's like, we never had any interaction on television again together whatsoever. So it's like, it didn't accomplish anything. And that's, you know, that's WCW to a T. So if, uh, if we want to take Eric Bischoff's quote, it's like, well, that was the seven and a half minute mark. Yeah, <laughs> that makes perfect sense. And well, your comments make perfect sense. The 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 angle doesn't. And this is something we we discussed with um with Guy Evans as well about his Nitro book that that they just there wasn't any kind of I guess you'd call it succession planning in that those the, the Hogan Savages Halls and Ashes wouldn't wouldn't be around forever as much as they they thought they probably could be and everyone else had their legs cut off so there wasn't any opportunity for anyone else to to grow yeah and that's that's the double-edged sword in that if you you know back up several years one of the ways by which eric bischoff managed to get many of these big name talents that led to his 83 weeks was by giving them creative control. Yeah. So once you now get to, you know, 99, 2000, how can anyone, whether it be Eric or Russo or whoever else is part of the creative process, how are they ever going to book a long-term strategy that can prepare them for when these guys are gone when they all have creative control? It's, you know, I, I'm assuming, again, that's why, like, I don't know who his idea was. I think it was Russo's, and it was a perfect idea. It was just done backwards in that, like, the New Blood versus the Millionaires Club yeah. was the angle that could have salvaged WCW. If the story was, here's the veteran millionaires that are using power and influence to hold all the young guys down, and the rich older guys are the heels and the hungry young talented guys with the future are the baby faces and you do this feud and the end of the feud is the young guys who are the i'm doing air quotes here future of the company are the baby faces that triumph in the end and send the older guys away yeah and then you've got something new but they did this angle and they made the young guys the heels and the older guys the millionaires club were the baby faces and it's like at that point we're all dead and i wouldn't be surprised if many of those in the millionaires club were the ones behind it because with the young guys being the heels they could and i'm doing air quotes again put us over because we can do the cheating the chicanery and all of the you know the bogus ref the outside interference the this and that to get our, I'm doing air quotes again, wins. But when they win, since they're the baby faces, they beat us clean. And it's like, so the story you're telling is that we're all not as good, oh. which means there's no transition, there's no future. Where if they were the heels and we were the baby faces, they would be the ones cheating to get the unjust wins, which would make the story make sense, where they can say, well, you know, you guys... You, you say you're the future, but you're not winning. And it's like, well, we are the future. You guys are cheating. It's like that story makes sense. Yeah. And then eventually you work out the way by which that we get our clean, victorious wins. And again, whether it be in 2000 or 2003 or 2005, whatever, I'll let that be debated. But there's the future of the new generation that overcomes. And if you do a good job of telling that story then in theory, the younger guys should be big enough stars by then to carry the company. And there was actually, I've got to say, there was very nearly a point in time, we've we've been over this on a couple of episodes, Dean, where uh, I think a year before they actually ran the New Blood Millionaires Club storyline, they very nearly had something like that on TV in 99, uh, where it was like you had Ric Flair as the president and he had guys like... Um, the, the triad and 
DDP on his side and Randy Savage and Sid were there at some point. And you had that, it led to the beginning of that revolution stable. And uh, it kind of, yeah, it basically, it frittered out very fast because it became clear what the end game would have been with, with the guys acting like, you know, they, they were the hills and, uh, also, I think they didn't like the implication that they were old and over the hill, so it didn't last very long. And then finally, we did we did have that serious go of it. And well, in the end, I think it lasted about as long, didn't it? Because by the time you debuted, Lance, I think they were moving in different directions already. Yep, and, and that's where again, when you have a portion of your roster with creative control, it makes it incredibly hard for anyone. And that's where I, you know, I, I I would cut a lot of the creative people some slack where if they plan three or four weeks in advance, but it's like if you show up at Nitro and then someone with the creative clause in their contract goes, yeah, I'm not doing that. It's like, I got to rewrite the show. Mm. And well, when you have a month long plan and have to start rewriting the show, you just stop having that plan because it's like, why bother planning four weeks out when I'm not sure I can get everybody to agree to do what I need this week? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's um, there's one story that I know that is, has has given birth to one of our our catchphrases on this podcast, <laughs> which is um, which is uh, you, you know uh, Robbie Brookside, um, mm-hmm. British wrestler. Yeah, he um, I, I remember talking with him in the dressing room once before a show, and he he mentioned that um, he was at a Nitro taping, and uh, Randy Savage arrived at the venue, and with, and there was like a, a whiteboard with all the matches and all the segments written up, and he was uh, apparently he was meant to be facing Disco Inferno, and because he had creative control, he uh, didn't like the sound of that, so he just looked at the board, went nope, and just wiped his name off and kept walking into the dressing room, and and that's exactly what you're talking about, that creative control. Yeah, and, and it's so funny because. When I broke into the business, I don't know whether I was just naive or what, but it's like the first time I heard someone complain about a finisher, try to change something. I was just like, you can do that. It's like, I just, (laughs) I always, because again, this was definitely naivety was the, I just assumed that it's like, it's a professional thing. And it's like, well, there's the booker and he just tells you what to do. So everybody just shows up and does what they're told. So when I broke in, they're like, do this this many minutes i'm like okay and it's like you're doing this okay and then the first time you see someone go yeah that doesn't work for me and then they change something it's like oh (laughs) i didn't know you could do that and it's if you have enough pull or you have that clause in your contract i guess you can you're the perfect employee what can i say um so so when when you went to wwf as it was then what what differences did you notice between working for WCW, working for WWF? I think the biggest, especially at the beginning, was just morale. Like like WWF, it was a E, but F at the time, was so like everyone in the locker room was excited. They loved wrestling. And and the the comparison I like to make or to or to illustrate the difference. I won't say who it was, but in WCW, we had a European tour the one time and we had a connecting flight um, from one city to the next. It was just a charter plane. Like it was just, we're the only ones on this plane. And one of the top guys realized that technically this plane didn't have a first class cabin. All of the seats were the same. (laughs) Oh God. And he told someone in the office, it's like, I'm not getting on that plane. My contract says I fly first class. And the agent's just like, this is a charter plane. It's the only one we have. We have to make the other town. It's like, well, my contract says I don't have to get on that plane. I'm not getting on that plane. And then there's, you know, the phone calls back to legal and to try to, <clears throat> and I think they, <clears throat> excuse me. I think they eventually compensated him enough financially that he agreed to get on the plane. <laughs> so that was the WCW locker room oh, atmosphere. That's crazy. And there was a early on a WWE house show. And all of the house shows were, you know, pretty much the same. But the Undertaker came versus like DDP and whoever the other person of that group would have been. Tag match was the big match before intermission. And then whatever the Steve Austin, he was still babyface Steve Austin. No, he was part of the alliance, but he was the world champion. He was the main event. Yep. 
and I think they did a DQ in the tag, but all of the invasion guys would run in and it was like, you know, a lot of the power plant guys and stuff. And it'd be like, you all run in and take choke slams from Kane and Taker to give a happy ending going into your mission. So again, there's, you know, the Ricos and the, you know, Sean O'Hare, all these guys are running in taking choke slams. On the one host show, we're just sitting in the locker room and the guy comes in, hey, we're doing this, everybody else. And Steve Austin, who's technically the head of the Alliance, he's like, you know, I don't think it's fair. You guys are in there. He's like, I need to get me one of those. And we sort of thought he was joking. And then sure enough, on a house show, he's the main event. He's the biggest star in the business. And it's like they start getting ready to send the run in. And he stands up and he takes his watch off and he hands it to Jericho. And he's like, hold my watch. He says, I got to go get me one of those. <laughs> and without anyone knowing, after the first wave of invasion guys run in and take these choke slams, here comes Stone Cold Steve Austin running in on a Mississippi house show. And he just, and again, you can see Taker and Kane sort of look at each other with, holy shit, Steve's coming. And he runs in and takes a choke slam from the one, bounces and feeds up to the other, takes a choke slam from him and then rolls out of the ring and then leaves with all the rest of the invasion guys. And he comes through the curtain, he takes his watch from Chris and says, thanks, and puts his watch back on and sits down. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, here's the biggest star in the business that ran in and took two extra bumps just because he thought it would be fun. And it's like, that was the atmosphere in the WWF locker room when we got there, rather than the agents having to phone legal to find out if they can force this guy to get on the private plane that we have to take him to the next show. That is, that is amazing. Uh, and, uh, I mean, that's part and parcel of the, of the house shows, isn't it? Just having, I mean, there's, there's trying things out and there's working out moves and working things out between you and your opponent but but having fun is is part and parcel of it yes and, and, yeah. and again you know, just crazy that especially you know this is you know he's got a bad neck he's the top star he's like i'll just feed in and take some extra bumps because it'll be fun <laughs> okay one one final question for you lance um if you could turn back the clock and change one thing about your time in WCW, what would it be? The final match, no, it was actually, was it, it was the first match actually, but my match with Buff Bagwell in the US title tournament, mm -hmm. this was a case of when they came to me, because again, the half crab's the finish, and I'm told, and actually I, I heard him complaining about doing the job earlier in the day. Buff was complaining about having to be the one that has to sacrifice to get other people over and was complaining about doing the job. But the finish was explained to me that I'm going to get the crab on him. And okay. then they play the video of uh, Positively Canyon or whatever the hell he was doing at the time, going to, you know, give the diamond cutter to Buff's mom in the parkade or something. And I was told, so Buff's going to see the video and to protect Buff, he's going to tap out sort of as a, I might fight the hold, but I got to just get out of here. I'm, you know, surrendering the match almost to go save my mom. But I don't know whether that's just the way it was pitched to me and it was pitched to him differently, but he did more of the, I'm crawling to the rope and my hands are hitting the mat in succession as I crawl. And I'll consider that my tap. And when I watched it back, it was just rotten. Like I put the crab on him and he basically just scampers to the ring, to the ropes and leaves. And it's like, they ring the bell and say he tapped out, but it's like in no way, shape or form did this guy tap out. He just crawled to the ropes and left. So if I had it to do over again, I would have sat on that guy in the middle of the ring with that half crab and not let go of him or not let him get to any of the ropes until he actually submitted clean in the middle of the ring. And then I would have let him go. That's what I would have liked to have done if I had a moment to go back and do it again. I don't know. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I mean, yeah, this, it goes, it goes back to, to what you, you saying about, uh, different atmospheres in different companies, certainly. And, and, and people, I guess people, going into business for themselves a bit more in, in WCW than WWE. But anyway, Lance, I what, just... What, can, do you have time for one more story? Oh, oh absolutely. Tight? Absolutely. <laughs> because again, I was just getting started. Like I was only there like three or four weeks when I did this, which is one of the reasons why it's like, well, whatever Buff's doing, I'll let him do. He's, a, he's further up the food chain than me. But 
later on, I was getting, you know, more comfortable in my spot. And Buff was one of those that was, you know, played the top guy card a lot. There was a pay-per-view and it was Buff and Luger against Palumbo and O'Hare for the, you know, WCW tag titles or whatever. Oh, I remember this. And Buff and Lex were to put them over and they didn't want to. And they ended up doing like a two minute match where they both got pinned and they laid there in the middle of the ring and refused to get up. It was sort of a, a bit of a protest. It's like, oh, okay, you want us to lay down, we'll lay down and make a joke of it. Yep. And I was in Gorilla and they like had to throw to a video package backstage because the guys weren't getting up. And it's like, we got to go to the next thing. What are they doing? Why won't they leave? And it was a big you know, kerfluffle. And when they came through the curtain, and again, I was standing by Fit. Fit and I were pretty tight. And Buff came through the curtain with us like, you know, sorry guys, you know, the, I know the match was short, but, you know, it's all we could get out of them. And I remember thinking, it's like, it's all you get out of them. It's like, you guys did nothing. Well, as it would turn out, the very next day on Nitro, it was Mike Awesome and I against Palumbo and O'Hare. And it was like, that's when I'm like, okay, I'm going to prove a point here because I'm going to get a hell of a lot more out of these guys than those okay. guys claim they could. So it was like, I was on a mission on Monday with like, I'm going to have a way better match than these guys did out of them to prove that, you know, they could get more out of these guys. So we had the match on Nitro, which again, don't take my word for it. Go find it and watch both matches and you tell me which was better. As a bit of a, you know, a, inside my head, a screw you. And I remember, and again, I love fit. When I came through the curtain, Fit Finley was just standing there, and he's like, you and Luger should just trade money. He'd <laughs> still be overpaid, but at least you'd get what you're worth. <laughs> and I started, thanks, Fit. Yeah, he uh, he's uh, straight talking, most definitely. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, he, he's someone that um, that started out in the in the, the UK scene. And, yeah, sto stories of Fit are uh, a legion, but, man, an absolute legend. Oh, that he's, is, that is great. the best. Bar none, he is the best. That is fantastic. Lance, thank you so much for your time. Um, if people want to get hold of you on social media, uh, where can they um, where can they find you? Twitter's their best bet, at Lance Storm on Twitter. I do have an at Storm Wrestling Academy on Instagram, but uh, the Twitter is by far the busier and the one with the more information. So at Lance Storm on Twitter is the uh, best place to find me. Listen up, slap nuts. That's right. This is Jeff Jarrett, the chosen one. And you're listening to Because WCW. Now choke on that. Well, I think that was like the most Because WCW thing we'll ever have, wasn't it? Ah, well, if you're ever wondering if if a podcast name after 100 episodes was completely justified or if it's a little bit harsh considering some of the things we admittedly enjoy when we look back on it i think lance there has summed up that yeah it, it definitely still justified i mean i just find it incredible that you've got a a nationally broad or well, internationally broadcast television show every week and they are literally making it up as they go along yeah and you, you you just hope when you hear these things about long-term booking being in place at the current alternative all elite wrestling you know whether you like it or dislike it whether there's certain bits to get on your own enough like there, there, there's bits i think sh- shouldn't be the case and this that and the other but if they just keep doing what they're doing and they have that long-term vision that's being widely reported you just think maybe maybe just maybe we'll have a a, a decent viable alternative because as we keep saying yeah. it's a it's a broken record on this show we we loved those cw we loved what it could have been we loved the concept of just having an alternative it's yes. important for the market for the audience and for the people working in the industry and uh yeah a, a lot of the romance we have for it was because it was the alternative not necessarily because it was amazing Part of, there's always a part of a bitterness towards WCW and to TNA to an extent for having that capacity and then blowing it. Yeah. And just hope that it doesn't get blown again because the market needs a mainstream alternative. Indeed, it makes it makes Vince do things better as well, definitely. But um, no, he was he was a 
really good, uh, really good guest. Very happy to talk, and and, um, and and what a great way to uh, to uh, to wrap up our hundredth episode. And um, I, I guess that means we should be wearing our because WCW t-shirts in celebration this weekend at the Hooked on Wrestling SummerSlam parties. Absolutely, I'll be in celebratory mood. We have hit a hundred episodes. We are finally getting back to the pub in a large scale situation after this, you know. After a golden age of podcasting with a positive spin, but after 18 months of really challenging times is the reality of it. Oh, it was a pleasure to to get on the fast track to 100 with you during those two lockdowns, Dean. But I'm so glad to be getting back to these parties. And it is, it's going to be amazing. Hooked on wrestling. They're all over the country. You and I will be at the London event yep, in particular. I am. Yeah, I'm hosting or co-hosting the uh, the London event at the uh, Sports Bar and Grill on Old Street near uh, Shoreditch in London. Um, but uh, if you go to hookedonwrestling.co.uk forward slash tickets, um, and you can you can see the details of the venues. Um, but um, in a nutshell, we are hosting parties in Leeds, London, Newcastle, Edinburgh, Brighton, Cardiff. Glasgow, Manchester, and Birmingham. And if you go onto that page as well, you can also buy tickets for um, a handful. I think it's uh, six venues. Yes, six venues that we're hosting uh, an all out AEW all out 2021 viewing party on Sunday, the 5th of September. Um, and they are happening at Birmingham, Cardiff, Glasgow, Leeds, London, and Manchester. Again, go to hookedonwrestling.co.uk forward slash tickets for all the information about uh, the venues and ticket prices and everything else like that. But I can't wait, just like you, Liam, I can't wait to have these tickets back. It has been these shows, shows back even. And, and I'm so tickets. excited, you can't even I'm, say the right yeah. words. Well, we are, I'm excited to have t- tickets back because tickets mean you're going to something so you know i am i'm excited about the tickets as well thank you very much as the party anyway that brings us to an end of episode 100 from liam and my and myself as well a sincere heartfelt thank you to every person who has downloaded any of our episodes it makes it worthwhile what we do um if you don't already please give us a follow on twitter at because wcw spread the word and we will see you very shortly for episode 101 so on behalf of liam this is me the twisted genius saying thanks for listening and i'll see you ringside